Welcome to Wizard World Virtual Experiences. I'm Jerry Milani, and today I'm joined by five stars who made some of the great TV sitcoms so awesome. We'll be with them in just a minute. I want to remind everyone, whether you're watching on Twitch or on Facebook or on YouTube, to go on into the chat. If you have a question for one or more of the celebrities, go in and put it in there. We'll get to as many of those as we can in the next 40 minutes or so. Best questions are the ones that uh, multiple celebrities would be able to answer. But if you have something uh, you want to ask, go ahead and put it right in there. We'll try to get to as many as we can. This free Q&A, hopefully everyone enjoys this today and uh, we'll be uh, taking uh, the, just a, a, this time with these celebrities here, but you can get a little bit more time with them uh, next Sunday. So if you're watching today on the 17th, that's great. If you're missing it and watching it during the week on the 24th, a week from today, we're gonna have the live video chats, the recorded videos, the virtual photo ops and the autographs available all until then. That's a nice little bonus for folks. In fact, We'll have a, a couple of combinations and things we'll talk about later uh, that you'll be able to get those at wizardworldvirtual.com. That's the place for the schedules of everything we have upcoming, as well as the place to be able to purchase those special experiences here at Wizard World Virtual. Coming up at Wizard World Virtual Experiences over the next few weeks, we've got a lot of fun stuff. Coming up this Thursday, we're going to do a rewatch of the Legends of Tomorrow panel, but with Tal Ash, who was on the original panel. That should be fun. Next Saturday, Chris Kattan from Saturday Night Live will be here with us. And then the following weekend on January 30th, we've got a doubleheader. Stargate, SG-1, and Atlantis will be a panel with those folks. And then Dolph Lundgren will do a panel also on the 30th. And then the following week on February 6th, We'll have Lark Borges from Saved by the Bell, which was a lot of fun, followed by Morgan Fairchild also on February 6th. So a lot of great stuff coming up over the next couple of weeks here at Wizard World Virtual. Go to wizardworldvirtual.com for all those details. <clears throat> Wizard World Vault is the place that we've called 20 plus years of Wizard World Comic-Con conventions, pop culture conventions. We've got stuff from all of those shows and much more. Go to Wizard World Vault to make those purchases. Well, right now I'd like to introduce you to some of the stars that, as I said, made some of those great TV sitcoms so awesome. You'll recognize the names and you'll recognize the faces right away. We appreciate you joining <clears throat> us today here at Wizard World. First, he has more than 150 TV and film credits, including amazing voice work in Archer, Phineas and Ferb, and the Looney Tunes show. Appeared in 20 episodes of Seinfeld as Elaine's boss, Jay Peterman. Here is John O'Hurley. Here I come. And there he is. There. John, welcome back. <laughs> nice. It's nice to talk with you. How are you today? I'm very well. Is that Myanmar behind you? Burma? What is it? Uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure palace. My four-poster pleasure palace. Love it. Thanks for uh, being with us, John. Uh, next, he was Danny Zuko in the original Grease Broadway, Broadway production, Brad Majors in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and George Washington in the 1984 miniseries by that name. Just a few of more than 200 roles. He played the bumbling mayor throughout the run of the hit series Spin City. Here is Barry Bostwick. Hi. Hi, Jerry. How are you? Barry, welcome back. So Barry's a veteran of the Wizard World world. Yep. First time yes, on I, one of our virtual experiences, though. Have you been, Barry? I've been been really good. I've been really good. You know, staying close to home like everybody else. Great and uh, yeah, looking forward to this. All right. He's gone on to an amazing career on stage and screen with more than 100 TV and movie credits, including runs on Gotham, Girls, and New Heart. And his first big role was as Henry and Hildegard Desmond in Bosom Buddies. Here's Peter Scolari. Hey, yo, Jerry, how you doing, Jerry? I'm good. Peter was Yogi Berra also in a tremendous production uh, on Broadway. On Broadway uh, it was called Bronx, Bronx Bombers. How did you know that? So, I mean, I was there. I went to, <laughs> I went to at, least, at least twice. I don't know. Uh, also, you might remember him as, the, as Prince Valium in Spaceballs or for his roles on ALF, Ned's The Classified School Survival Guide, and The Bold and the Beautiful. But for many of us, he'll be the bumbling Monroe for several years on Too Close for Comfort. Here is Jim J. Bullock. Hi, Jerry. How are you? I'm good. Hello, everyone. John, I'm Hi. also in my pleasure palace, too, with my four poster bed. With uh -huh. my and yours, I see. And yours is already decked out with uh, with it. With a little uh, kit, a feline. <laughs> yes, I almost said something else. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> we know that's not oh. true. Well, we just turned this into pay-per-view. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, she's an actress, producer, writer, director, pretty much everything in Hollywood. She's done it all. You've seen her on The Dukes of Hazard, Knight Rider, The Love Boat, Hunter, all the shows you loved growing up. But her most prominent role was Sarah Rush in more than 100 episodes of Too Close for Comfort. Here's our friend Lydia Cornell. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Lydia. So good to be here. Good to see you again. Lydia has also been to uh, our Wizard World shows. So. The gang's all here. Welcome in, guys. Thanks for taking time on a Sunday to join us. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. So let me start by asking, and I'll, I'll kind of go around the room a little since there's so many of you rather than everyone trying to, to, to ask at the same time, but talk about the sitcom format, what you like about it, how playing comedy might be different from other formats and other things. And you guys have all done so many different things. I'll start with you, John. How is, how is playing comedy different than other things you've done well you know to answer that correctly you have to say what type of comedy are you talking about because there was the pre-established sitcom format with the three cameras and the way the the scripts were written you were always setting up for a joke you deliver the joke the crowd would laugh would go on to the next setup for the next joke uh and and then it was interspersed with plot now i ended up going over to a show called seinfeld and all of those rules changed uh in the first day that i got there and I, as I remember picking up my phone after the first script reading, and I said to my manager, I go, this show's not funny. <laughs> and what I, what I had learned was that none of the scenes were funny because, excuse me, none of the jokes, there were no jokes in the show. And what you did was you played the scene honestly, and you had to trust that the scene would be funny. And that was a new style of comedy for me. Um, so that's, uh, that was my answer. It depends on what style of comedy. And <clears throat> a lot of comedies now have gone back to the, uh, that Seinfeldian idea of trying to make funny scenes rather than trying to be joke your way through it. Yeah. Barry? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, all I want to do is get three laughs every episode I'm in. <laughs> you know, and if I can't, if I, then I feel like I've made my money. Uh, yeah. I don't ask for more than three laps. And whether it's a setup joke or whether it's a situation, um, that's my whole criterion right there. And uh, uh, that and um, uh, when's lunch? <laughs> yeah. And Peter, how's playing comedy for you as opposed to your drama? Role? You know, Jerry, I jumped out in the late 1970s from off Broadway. Uh, basically to a 1950s style bosom buddies, you know, a kind of show that could have run in the 1950s or 60s more successfully than it did in the 1980s, you know, and then transitioned into the new heart show, which was more of that in sort of intellectual conceit, more of what John's talking about, you know, just like a, a feeling of what's, you know, that something is intellectually funny and we're not gonna stop and make big jokes about it. You know, we're gonna kind of play these scenes and let the then respect the audience a little bit. So that was my experience early on, was I had a little bit of the the wacky, you know, like men dressing as women, ridiculous thing, and, and went into a much more cerebral, more modern, you might say, sitcom. And then Jim, you, Jim, you did soaps, you did too close. What was the difference there? Well, Too Close was my first professional gig. Uh, so it was, I just kind of went from, you know, being a, a messenger boy to getting that job on Too Close for Comfort. And, you know, I mean, uh, I, I've, I've never studied a lot. I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what I do is I just, what is what I do. And I love, uh, the format of, of sitcom work. I love the Monday table read through and the bagels and the coffee and the Friday taping and then go home and have a fabulous weekend and come back and have a, another great week. And Lydia, how about for you? Well, I had a mad crush on Jim Bullock when we first started the show and I was shaking when I went to work every day because I thought, oh, I hope he looks at me. And you know, wow. I was barking up the wrong tree. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> that was the first <laughs> And Jimmy and I know we went on a talk show and we talked about this. Um, I'm the only one that didn't know. Anyway, 
we, I love the multicam format, which it means we were on with a live audience and a warm up comic on Friday nights. We do two, two shows on a Friday in full makeup, but the whole week was just rehearsal, like on a theater stage. I love theater. I started in theater, by the way. Yeah, so yeah. it was an enemy of the people. And, but then I did Curb Your Enthusiasm and I love, I love the tone of a, a comedy that has no laugh track. I really like, because I write comedy like that all the time, and I don't like jokes, but it's completely two different animals, completely different. You know, one of my, I write, um, like, all human suffering is caused by Victoria's Secret. You can't put in a bunch of jokes like that in a show where it's about something, where you have a story. So the character is the humor, the way John in Seinfeld. So Larry David writes character humor. The humor comes out of the crazy bumbling characters. It doesn't, it's not set up joke punchline. What do you all think about the multi? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, can I say something? I, I, I last year, a year and a half ago, so I did a Will and Grace, and it was the most horrible time of my life because it was so stressful because there was so many people on the other side of the camera hoping, wishing, praying that it was good and that you had, there was so much stress that to get the joke right the first time. Because if you went into a second take and a third take, you knew and they knew that the audience had already heard the joke. So therefore you had to try extra hard or they had to come up to you and give you an alternative line or something. But I find the three camera, uh, the three camera setup uh, very stressful and, and not just because of the acting situation, but the business situation, the whole, the whole atmosphere is too charged for me, too charged. I'd much rather do a single camera comedy where you can just go over and over and get it right and massage it and, and not have, uh, you know, everybody in the network uh, looking over your shoulder. Oh, yeah. You're better at bumbling, Barry, you're sort of trying to say. You'd rather be bumbling. A bumbling. Uh, Jerry, are you calling me bumbling? I, I'm, I'm no, just your character. You're, you're oh, such, I see. Yes. Such a good actor. You're such a good actor <laughs> that you're not really bumbling. Well, it's funny, Jerry, um, and off of what Barry said, I did a sitcom some years ago, and I, I thought I had a good bit of business. Uh, and we all on the panel, we all know that's some little uh, uh, prop work that we might have worked out to augment our joke. And I got an okay laugh, and the, and, but I wasn't satisfied. And the showrunner came over to me and said, where would you like the laugh? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I can put it any, I can tell the audience to laugh. But I said, what do you mean? They're a paid audience? <laughs> and they were. And it was a hit show I, that will remain nameless. And I was mortified. I couldn't do anything after that. I didn't respect the audience anymore. I said, you're, you're, you're a bunch of shills, you know. <laughs> Ruined me for that day. Take the last where you can for get that day. <laughs> so we have people who are checked in from all kinds of places, Oklahoma, Michigan, Illinois, California, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Canada, Oregon, North Carolina, Wisconsin. So uh, we're popular wow. all over the place. A lot of fans checking in. Uh, Sherry Clawson wanted to say uh, that she saw Jim J. Bullock in a touring production of Hairspray a few years back and almost yep. have done a lot of uh, Broadway. Oh. Um, Brian Nussbaum uh, also checking in. Gary Collins the second, uh, also very interested. But he has a question that I'm going to I'm going to start with his question and kind of expand it to everyone else. Uh, Gary Richard Collins the uh, second. He says, "Hi, I'm from Michigan." Question was from was for Peter, and he was going to ask you about a specific um, celebrity. I want to do this too. I'm going to ask you about someone that you worked with, and I'll be I'll, I'll give you someone and. And just tell me what your um, what your impression was, or a story, or something. And Peter, the one I want to ask you about is Tom is Tom Poston. Tell me about working with Tom. I knew Tom when he was doing Mork and Mindy uh, at Paramount, <clears throat> and he was uh, he seemed to be about fifteen years older. He was really about thirty years older, and he treated me well. Uh, and it was a couple of years late. I used to hang on his coattails all the time. He introduced me to Jonathan Winters. He introduced me to Robin Williams. He'd take me around, me and Tom Hanks. He'd take us around and show us off. Look at these you know, young kids. 
I never forgot that. And then joined him on the New Heart show as a regular. Uh, and, and then I had a, an experience for almost seven years where he became one of my best friends. He was at my wedding. I, mean, uh, I miss him very deeply, very deeply. Lydia, I want to ask you about Audrey Meadows. Oh, I love Audrey Meadows. First, may I just say I did a special with Jonathan Winters in Puerto Vallarta where we each played, he played a, a maid, a chambermaid. And I'd <laughs> bar and get a drink from him. Oh, I love him. And Tom Poston. Um, Audrey was my, my idol. She, was, she took me under her wing on the show the first year. And she's the one who encouraged me to go to Beirut, Lebanon for the USO tour that year when Bob Hope couldn't go. She said, you'll never forget this experience. Do everything you can for the troops and you know, for public service. And she got in trouble for smoking. So she, would, she brought these cucumbers from her, her estate in Beverly Hills and she'd bring a big cucumber that she was growing. She sliced it in half and she put her cigarette out in it really quick when Arnie would come. Arnie Sultan was our producer who produced Get Smart and, and a lot of other shows. And he was really like, regimented, you know, authoritarian leader on the set. And she was scared of him. So we'd all sneak around and Selma Diamond would smoke. Uh, wait, did I smoke with you, Jim? <laughs> I'm always pretending I didn't smoke. Yeah. But Audrey was a beautiful, elegant woman, but she had this other really, um, you know, body side. She was wonderful. I love her. I miss her. Jim, I want to ask you about Nancy Dussault. Oh. I love Nancy so much. Uh, you know, I met when I met her on 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 the set. Uh, I completely clicked with uh, everybody. I felt, and you know, I, I I clicked with Lydia and Deborah, and and Ted and Nancy. And Nancy was just. Uh, I was, she had done so much more than me. I just done nothing, you know, and I just, I was always a wealth of information coming from her and her experience. I mean, my God, she was in the Sound of Music on Broadway in its original run. I mean, she had had some major credits and some great experience. And I was just like a sponge for it. And Nancy would, in, would invite me over and all of us over and I would have her over to my house. And we're still good friends today. I, I haven't seen her in a while because she moved up and I'm down here in Palm Springs. So, you know, <clears throat> not that far, but you know, you know, it's like a big deal for me to go to. These days, it's anything as far. Yeah. Walmart is my place. That's where I got these curtains. <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> I would take that off, so. <laughs> no, I love Nancy. I'd love to see her do one of these. I think she'd have a ball. Barry, mm -hmm. tell me about interaction with Connie Britton. Never liked her. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah, I didn't th Never liked her, didn't think she was talented. And I didn't think she had a career ahead of her. And look what the hell happened. She, uh, she went on and on and on and on. Uh, Connie Britton. Uh, you know, Connie fought, fought for the woman's voice on Spin City for a long time. And uh, she never quite was able to convince them to write more for the women in the show. And uh, I think she was always frustrated by that. Uh, I know she was frustrated by that. Um, and uh, so I think when she finally left the show, I think there was a sense of relief and, um, uh, and uh, I never thought she'd work again, but she did apparently. <laughs> Happens. And, uh, and John, Happens. I wanna ask you about Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Why did I think you were going to ask me that? <laughs> I'm sorry, we needed that in the form of a question. Um, actually, uh, very simply, the most talented uh, comedic actress that uh, I have worked with, and I think that we have seen in this generation of um, of comedic actors, actresses, whatever we want to, whatever we want to call them, um, she would do whatever it took to get the laugh. She would go down. She was one of those actresses that was courageous enough to go down with the ship no matter what it was, the creation of the Elaine dance. She would make her look herself look like an absolute buffoon if it would get the laugh. And, 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 and truly one of the more, and I would say this of the four that I worked with on Seinfeld, truly this, the four of the smartest actors that I have worked with. And I truly believe that comedy is 
the gift of intelligent people because learning to be silly is a very, very intellectual exercise, believe it or not, learning to make fun of yourself. And she was just an absolute a princess at that. She could, no matter what it was, she would find the laugh. And in that respect, it made it so much easier to have that kind of uh, kind of surreal Mary Tyler Moore, Ed Asner type of relationship with uh, Peterman and Elaine. Uh, and she was always going to be the consummate victim in the workplace. But uh, one of the most joyful experiences I've had. You had the urban sombrero. She wore that all through that episode, so you could get the and, not, not, and and the priceless piece of wedding cake. Elaine, do you have any idea what happens to a butter-based frosting after six decades in a poorly ventilated British basement? I have a feeling what you are about to go through will be punishment enough. <laughs> Dismissed. Oh, well. so funny. Oh, <laughs> We've got a few more great questions from fans, and I love this one. I don't know if all of you were, were involved with game shows. I remember. Jim, I remember you on, on game shows. John, obviously, Family Feud. Dominic D has a question saying, John, you hosted Family Feud. Jim, you were the center square on Hollywood Squares. Any game show memories? What was fun about doing those game <laughs> shows those years? Yeah. Lydia, you did some game shows. Yeah, I, I won $50,000 for a woman. I beat Fred Grandy, and he went to Yale, so I'm proud of that. Wow, Lydia. Dang. Well, what are some game shows, I, Jim? Yeah, talk, talk about your game show experiences. Well, I, uh, you know, I'm back in the '80s. All, all of you know, game shows were just everywhere. I mean, every weekend you could do a game show, and there were a lot of fun ones, and there were a lot of really stupid ones. And uh, but I was really fortunate enough to get to be on a good stupid one, the Hollywood Squares, and and to get to be on that for a good two and a half, three years, and I got to meet so many uh, legends that came through and was in those squares. Uh, I can't even begin to remember. I mean, Brad Pitt did the squares back before he became Brad Pitt. And just really, funny. I met Miss Kitty. I can't remember her name. She was Miss Kitty in Gunsmoke. Amanda Blake. Blake. Amanda Blake. Amanda Blake. I got to do a little, we did a skit together, like a, a Gunsmoke skit together. Me and Amanda Blake. I mean, I got to meet Mel Milton Burl and I mean, work with, you know, just Jaja. <laughs> it was fantastic. And it was, it was tic-tac-toe. Thank you. <laughs> I remember, um, well, I, I've been lucky enough to, to do two of the really great timeless shows. One of which was uh, um, To Tell the Truth and the other was uh, Family Feud. And uh, to tell the truth was, it, to tell the truth uh, was actually my favorite job in my career. It was the most enjoyable day at work I have ever mm -hmm. spent. Uh, we had fun. We laughed all day. And the last show that we did every day, and we, we worked on weekends, we taped 10 shows on a weekend. The last show of each day, I would take out a bottle of Cabernet, and that's what we would have underneath the desk. So everybody was drinking like Shriners. Uh, and it was such a, <laughs> but we had such a wonderful experience. But, you know, what I, what I actually loved the both about doing a game show, hosting one, was the idea that nothing was scripted. At least it, it certainly wasn't on Family Feud. And you had to trust that what you were is enough to process the information and be witty and be funny or, or at least move the show along. And I always loved starting the show from that simple prayer that I always say, God, let me be surprised uh, when I walk on stage. And, and I had to trust it that, that no matter what went on, I'd be able to handle it. Uh, and it was such a joyful experience for that reason. But it also gave people an opportunity to do some of the stupidest things I have ever seen on television. I had two guys, and I would consider them college educated, walk up to the, uh, to the face off there on Family Feud. And the question was, name a classic film that begins with the letter C. Now, you would say Caddyshack, uh, Citizen Kane, Casablanca. They were all up there. <laughs> Seabiscuit. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make that stuff up. Can't beat that. Wow. That sounds like me. <laughs> Dang. Uh, can I say something? Uh, when I got out of college and uh, went to Hollywood at the beginning, I auditioned for the dating game. The dating game, that where there was three, uh, three <laughs> bachelors, right? 
Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, you had to audition for that kind of stuff, you know, and uh, I, I, they didn't hire me. Um, <laughs> Because uh, I guess I wasn't interesting <laughs> enough. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't relaxed, enough. or 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 um, I don't know. But I, that was the first job I I didn't get out of college was the dating game, and then I went on uh, the squares thing, and uh, I was I, I had a I, I was on the phone to the head writer of Spin City the whole time, because. I couldn't come up with one answer. You know, it's a lot of those things, as you know, Jim, I mean, you, you know what you're gonna say possibly if they give you a question, you know, and that's it. And so I had to make sure that I knew, uh, you know, a, some semblance of, of, of an answer. So um, I had them written down underneath the table. So if they asked me something, I would have a pre preconceived uh, yeah hopefully funny did you have did that what your experience was oh yeah that's what the writers wrote for everyone that was on the squares and they you know they always said if you don't have anything you you always have what was what has been written and the writers were fantastic writers Uh. but they also encouraged if you had something of your own that you could go off on they encouraged that too our family on Hollywood Squares, Too Close for Comfort Family, Ted Knight, everyone. And I remember we had, Paul Lind was in the center though, when we were on, do you remember? And he had, he, he was drinking wine and he spilled the wine. It went, dribbled down onto my head. I was right underneath him. Do you remember that? <laughs> Paul Lind was so funny. Oh. I thought he made up his own lines and we didn't get scripted because we were the guest stars. You know, we didn't have writers writing our jokes. No, Paul Lind didn't need writers, I guess. Oh, oh God, I love He was him. so funny. I want to remind everyone, uh, I hope you're enjoying the, the free, free Q&A today with everyone. This is a, certainly a great time, but you can go to the next level or go one, one further with those live video chats, the autographs, the recorded videos, and the uh, virtual photo ops that we have. That's a week from today, Sunday the 24th. Go to wizardworldvirtual.com uh, for those. Uh, each will we'll be doing them individually, but also Jim and Lydia together will be doing Too Close for Comfort um, autographs as well as videos. So get, get in there and you'll have a chance to, to do that. <laughs> RJ Santos also had a similar question about the, the game show. So thank you, uh, thank you, RJ, for, uh, for that question. Uh, uh, Denny Ayala just uh, saying, Lydia, you look beautiful as always. Thank and the rest you. of the panel's okay, he said. So we'll, we'll <laughs> with that. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate that from, from you, Jeannie Four. Uh, wanted to know, in addition to the ones that we spoke about before, is there a particular actor, and Lydia and Jim, I think uh, Ted Knight would be the one I want to ask about, but is there a particular actor that had a big influence on your career? Uh, Jim, I'll start with you for this one. Oh, yeah, I'd have to say Ted. Ted was, I I felt that Ted was like a show business father to me. Like I said, I had never done anything and I I was not from a savvy showbiz family. Uh, So it was kind of being catapulted uh, onto a network show back then was quite an an experience and a wonderful experience. Uh, But Ted uh, used to tell me that he felt, he saw himself in me when he was a younger man and that he wanted to do, uh, help me sort of over some of the rougher spots that he had had. And he had also been the second banana on the Mary Tyler Moore (laughs) show. And so uh, he had great understanding for the second banana uh, that I played, you know, up up against him. He was a great guy. I, I, I got to tell Ted, he could be difficult as Lydia can contest, but, uh, but, Ted and I, I felt like I really did feel that he really uh, had looked upon me as kind of his son, kind of in a way. Does that sound weird? Not not at all. Lydia, tell me (laughs) about working with Ted. Oh, I love Ted. Ted was, we had a love-hate relationship. He was like a real dad to me. And he was like, it reminded me of George C. Scott and Patton. In the Kiki episode, remember? He was so mad at us. And Deborah had gotten a lot of trouble. Oh my gosh, on the Merv Griffin show. They had to cut the tape because we said something wrong that I can't repeat here, but it, we were trying to be funny. It didn't come out right. And the whole, oh my God, Merv Griffin. We stayed up all night together crying. But, um, Whoa. but one day I'll tell you that story. Maybe next week. I um, want to hear it. 
You know the story. Oh, well, we can't talk uh, about it now. No, it's too long. <laughs> uh, that's a tease right there. I don't know. Can we is get there, away with that? This is the Wizard World virtual experience. Just the six of us. It's okay. No one will know. But anyway, my big hero, when I get into acting, Haley Mills. For some reason, I loved Haley mm -hmm. Mills in The Moon Spinners with Eli Wallach and Julie Christie and Audrey Hepburn. Those are my favorites. Those are the ones who, you know, I emulated or wanted to be. Peter, but, who's someone for you? Well, <clears throat> it's funny, Lydia made me think, go, go way, way back, because because you dug deep. I would have said right off the top of my head, well, Bob Newhart had a huge influence on my career, but if you talk about affecting the, the organic me, if I can be so pretentious, if I may employ such pretension, <laughs> it, was, it was more like Terry Thomas, Terry Thomas, Jerry Lewis, 1962, 60, these are the people who really affected me going forward <laughs> for 40 years, you know. Uh, not, not a wonderful man like Bob Newhart treating me well and showing me the ropes, he did. I'll be forever grateful. But when you think, when you're asking the question, who really got at you? It was probably, you know, uh, young Jerry Lewis. I, I'm not a man enough to admit it. <laughs> oh. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, for you. Uh, well, there's a couple of people. Well, the one that I, I really uh, was affected by was Jacques Tati. Uh, and if you don't know Jacques Tati's work, uh, a French filmmaker and comedian, and, uh, comedian, um, and uh, some of the most uh, exemplary physical comedy uh, performances that I've ever seen. And um, uh, so I studied him as a child or as a, as a young adult. And when I first uh, went uh, to New York and uh, was working in the theater, uh, I had a mentor uh, named Ellis Rabb, who was the head of APA Phoenix Repertory Company. And that's where I sort of started in New York. And Ellis uh, took me under his wing and uh, uh, took me around and showed me, you know, really what the theater was all about. And I was with the company. And uh, uh, I always I think of him as um, he's probably the first one who said to me, just stand there and do nothing. Mm. You know, and uh, I and 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 so that's uh, he he made me at that time trust that I was uh, interesting enough. And John, someone for you. Well, you know, I go back to Lloyd Bridges years and years ago um, because he he was in a series called Sea Hunt, which was a scuba diving crime solving story. Uh, very unusual um, and uh, introduced scuba to the national, the national conversation. Uh, and I was four years old at the time. And after watching Sea Hunt on Sunday nights, I would go put my Speedo bath bathing suit on with my little pot belly. Uh, I would strap a little uh, red plastic fire hydrant to my back with a belt. Uh, I would put on my goggles. I would take my father's basketball Converse sneakers, put them on, and then I would go into the bathtub and do the entire episode all over again, <laughs> as I best remembered it. Uh, so easy to say that he was my best. Uh, he certainly was my mentor. But I think the man who finally got a hold of me and, and uh, slapped some sense into me was... Uh, uh, God bless him, another great man who has passed away uh, a short time back, Mike Nichols. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was doing um, uh, King Arthur in uh, Spamalot, Mike uh, directed that both on Broadway and, uh, and all of the tours and everything, everything that we did. And he and I became quite close uh, over that time. And I would say he probably had more um, impact on me and comedy. And he said, and, and to echo what, what Barry was just saying, he said, you, you, you make it so difficult. Just be yourself. Go on stage and do nothing. And he says, you will find that that is interesting. And that, believe it or not, was, was a very difficult thing for me to do, to learn and to finally uh, actually take in, into the craft that I have is to, is to do nothing and trust that you are enough. So good. May I just add one more thing? James Earl Jones, I did my first movie with before Too Close for Comfort, the pilot, and then I got this movie in the Greek Isles and I had to drown all these drowning scenes 
trying to cover my boobs at the same time. But he taught me a lot about stillness, being very still. And he was, he was playing a character based on Othello. We were both smuggling buddies. And I learned a lot from him. He was the one I looked up to the most before I started the series. So. Okay, can I ask a question, Lydia? Yeah. How do you drown while covering your boobs? I was, I was trying, this is supposed to be comedy. They had these, the director said, I want you to be dead in the water with the seawater coming in your eyes, with the sun shining in your eyes. And meanwhile, the wardrobe lady and I were trying to do a no topless. So I had zinc oxide over there. I tricked them. I outfoxed them. Oh. <laughs> it's been a lifetime of trying to, you know, keep your clothes in business. Oh, I I've done, love you, I, I've done that. I've done that. <laughs> we never know where Wizard World virtual experiences are going to be. Oh, we never know you're so going to have good. that on the show. Yeah. So the, the next question as we're, we're winding time down a little bit here, I want each of you to make a case for either the primary show you were on or another show that you were on as the best sitcom of all time. John, why is Seinfeld or another show, if you want to do a different one, that's okay. You want to go off the board. Why is that the best sitcom of all time, John? Well, um, I mean, certainly I, I would have to say Seinfeld is the, the best sitcom of all time. Uh, it, it had the courage to do things that no one else did. Um, it was about language. As Shakespeare once said, the play is the thing. It's not the actor. It's not the producer. It's the play, the words. And Seinfeld was brilliantly written. Um, I, I go back and I, I look at some of these uh, Peterman monologues that they wrote, that many of which were stricken from the show because the show was too long, 10 minutes too long every week. But I, I look at some of the brilliance of that and it holds up today. The show holds it with the, with the exception of the fact that they had telescopic antennas on, the, um, uh, on his cordless telephone and a few other things. Absolutely everything is timelessly funny in that show. We are still dicing up the same comedic minutia every day of our lives that they were on that show some 30 years later. And I think that's probably the test of a, the test of a good show is, is it funny 30 years later? Barry, Spin City or another? Spin City. Oh, I, think, I think Seinfeld. Uh, what made Spin City so great then? What made it the second best? Uh, what made Spin City so good? I think just the cast. I mean, we had a very deep bench. Uh, all the actors, if you threw an A story to any one of the five or six actors, they could handle the full 23, 24 minutes. And, uh, uh, and so therefore, when there was a B story or a C story in terms of the script, they excelled. But they were all capable of, 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 of handling the whole show, handling, you know, the primary... Uh, issue that week and um uh you know except for connie Britton, i i i, I never liked her <laughs> peter bosom buddies one of my first favorite comedies when i was younger well you know bosom buddies was sort of like uh dealing us we felt when we did the show it was like dealing us an unwinnable hand there, there was no way as actors we were going to be able to overcome uh, our circumstances. Uh, you're, you're dressing us in women's clothing, which immediately creates the tension of how stupid the people are around you who haven't, don't recognize that you're just a man with a wig on. So we had all kinds of problems with that. And yet, and yet, uh, you will not drag me into hubris. Uh, uh, unwillingly, anyway. Uh, no, no pun intended with drag. By some stretch of the imagination, and in some in some corners of the world, Bosom Buddies is the best show uh, of all time. But of course not. But about three or four of them, <laughs> three or four of them out of the thirty-seven we made, I would stack up against the Giants. You know, the the the, the Seinfelds. Uh, and, and the Frasers and the Cheers and Taxi and, uh, and, and the original Bob Newhart show uh, and the Newhart show that I was a part of, some great stuff. So uh, I'll feel good about that. But, but the, the greatest show of all time, I didn't work on. Uh, I never got to work on Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. I Too didn't know close. That. Although, Jim, you, you did work on, on Seinfeld once. Yes? I did. Nice I did. segue, Jerry. 
Oh, wow. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for the plug, the 30 year old plug. Uh, no, <laughs> I did. I did the uh, I, an episode of Seinfeld called The Airport, where John, uh, Seinfeld, Jerry was in first class and Elaine was in coach. And I was the bitchy flight attendant in coach. It was actually a very funny episode. Okay. It was a very funny. Yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I can't say that Too Close for Comfort was the best <laughs> sitcom ever. I don't think that at all. I think it was a. It filled a niche, and I think it it definitely uh, had a, a good cast, and people loved each other, and you could tell there was uh, a lot of love on the set. I think that comes through when that happens. I just saw. Sh Shit's Creek, and you can't deny that those people cared for each other and loved each other. They had a great time, and we had a great time on our show. That's all it boils down to. That's all that matters. Lydia, what did Cheers. you love about Too Close? Let's put it that way. If we can't say it's one of the top two, because we've already picked three, what, what made it so great? Well, first of all, Seinfeld's my favorite, and Curb. Um, and I'm lucky I worked on Curb. But I loved our show because it had this fresh innocence. It brought back innocence. Our, our world needs more innocence right now. And we were a family where the father really spied on the daughters. We were, you know, was loosening, loosening on our phone calls and had a glass to the floor. And it just, I love the cast. I mean, we were really close. We loved each other. We worked together every day. We were next door to John Ritter the whole time when <laughs> he was on the other show, you know, the, set, the spinoff of Reed's Company. And we had so many fun times together. It was the family that was created that I loved. And um, we had some good shows. We were funny. I mean, nothing really risque or dirty. We did have a toilet flushing sound. We were the first show to ever flush a toilet on the air. And Ted Knight made a good deal out of that. He went, oh, they let us do that. And, and the couple still sleeping in bed together. There was a lot of love there. And oh, was, and also, if I may add to that, uh, Monroe was right. Well, so that was, an, that was an episode of Too Close for Comfort, which ABC pulled, and it was a lost episode until it's recently resurfaced. I mean, it's, yeah. it's so, so politically <laughs> wrong. So I have wrong. no idea how this show ever got past the network. By two women. By and two large women. That copy you can find somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, yeah, there's a, yeah. Good but, time. You had, you had the scandal of the of the Miss uh, whatever who was on the cover of your of the of the newspaper, and then she couldn't. Uh, they she they found out that she had some photos she took when she was nineteen. That was scandal. Oh, nudies, <laughs> art films. Who? Oh, <laughs> one good cool thing happened. Deborah von Valkenburg played my sister. When I got the part, I walked into the audition was hilarious, and I walked into the callbacks with the network. And Deborah's there, and at the end she goes, "What's your real name?" And I said, "Lydia Korniloff, Russian name, too hard to pronounce." She goes, "I work for a Gregory Korniloff in New York City, who's in Holland now. We lived, our parents lived in Holland." And I realized she worked for my father. We have ten million people in New York City. My sister worked for my dad, so we're really close friends today. Wow! Directed a movie that she was in that I wrote. So yeah, you didn't know that, Jimmy? No. Why isn't she here? Yeah, where's Deb? <laughs> That bitch. We'll have, to, oh. we'll have to do another reunion of Too Close. Yeah. For you know, we've, we've done about 180 of these uh, Wizard World virtual experiences. We've mixed and matched a little. I know, Peter, you've been on a couple times now. John, you're on a voice panel. So uh, coming back, Barry, we've got to get you on a, on a panel as well. We'll do a, we'll do a re reboot of this in, in some case. So before we close out, want a, a quick reminder to everyone that next Sunday, the 24th, we'll have those live video chats, the autographs, the recorded videos, and the virtual photo ops. Go to wizardworldvirtual.com for those. But want to give everyone a chance just to kind of each just talk about a project you're working on or a cause or anything. We'll just go around the room. And uh, John, we'll start with you. Uh, well, uh, I have a movie waiting for me in, uh, in Greece to start shooting as soon as they uh, clear us to go. Uh, I've got to return to Broadway to do uh, my show, uh, Chicago, the musical, as soon as we are able to put butts back in seats again. Um, and uh, we are talking now about the uh, anniversary revival of uh, Spamalot, believe it or not, oh uh, the, 10 year the, the 10 year anniversary, six years late. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, a bunch of things coming up and I'm still uh, writing and composing. So busy. 
And mm -hmm. I do my I do my Peterman monologues on Cameo. <laughs> Barry, besides coming back to Wizard World shows when we do them again, what else are you? Up well, to? Uh, right now I'm living in Florida, so my goal is to get a shot <laughs> in my arm. And apparently, there's a lot of other old people around me who are in, ahead of me in line. And I'm very upset about this. And so right now, that's what I want to do is get a vaccine, you know, so I can uh, go to Lowe's in three or four months without a mask on. Connie Britton called. She said, you're never getting one. <laughs> never liked her. Never, never liked her. And she's Peter, older than you are. Peter, <laughs> every time I see you're doing something different. Tell me what you're up actually. to now. Are you talking to me still? No, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Peter now. Oh, you were talking oh, okay. to Peter? Yes. Okay, Peter. Uh, you know, like Barry, I want to get that shot. And I'm up early in the morning with the vaccine finder here in New York City. And I then I had one, you know, like a fisherman. I had one on the line for a while, the vaccine, but I lost it. I'm sure all your listeners <laughs> want to hear about our progress. Uh, <laughs> last year, I appeared on a show called Evil. Uh, which is uh, on CBS, and I played a bishop, and due to an oversight in uh, casting, they have brought me back. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I'm filming in the middle of a pandemic. I, I, when I film, uh, uh, I'm COVID testing three times a week. Three times a week. Uh, yeah, so that I've got out until the end of May. I'm all, uh, I'm all booked up. Uh, mostly looking after my uh, my young children who aren't children anymore. I'm sure some of us have those uh, who live on their own, my son and daughter, uh, watching out, uh, trying to be a good dad. That's what I'm doing. Sounds good. What's in your world these days? Me? That's you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you say my name. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'm, I'm working on the COVID 25 pound gain, trying to round it off to an even 30. So I'm, I'm very close to that. And uh, <laughs> really, I had no, you know, this is not alcohol, but it will be very soon. Uh, we'll do another panel with Kendi, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, that would Always be fun. Allowed. Very, it's encouraged. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just uh, living day by day. It's just this world we live in. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? I don't have any plans for tomorrow. I really don't know what the, is going to happen tomorrow. So I'm just kind of living uh, and with a wonder of like the fact that I, you know, w w waking up every day and what the world's going to bring this day. So before I leave, I'm going to say, Barry, I really love your hair. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I love yours too. Oh, thank you. I love everyone's hair. Oh, really? <laughs> Some of mine is real. <laughs> and Lydia, who clearly has the best hair of anyone on the panel yeah. here, what's, uh, what's in your world? These Do it, Lydia. Well, I finally finished the book I was writing. It's called Hiding My Brain in My Bra. And I talked about it probably in Sacramento last year. Um, and I wrote the pilot script for that. It's a comedy. It's a feminist, a post-feminist comedy. And I wrote with a partner who's a brilliant writer, Emmy nominated for Seinfeld, in fact, Lawrence Levy. We wrote the reboot for Too Close for Comfort script. And it's in rewrites right now. So I want to get Jimmy's, <laughs> Jimmy's, Jimmy. We all, we talked to Don Taffner about it and he got the rights. So I can announce that it's in the works. We're, we're, we're gonna try to get that together. The whole cast was interested in doing it, but we have a lot of younger people. They better hurry. Better, well, Too Close for Comfort is perfect for the pandemic because everyone's moving back in together. You know, or they have, have to own an internet company instead of a newspaper. <laughs> no yeah. Newspapers to own. Although my son lives a few blocks, he lives in Brentwood and he won't see me. He's so authoritative. Mom, I can't see you, I'm working. It's like, this is his excuse not to have to visit. <laughs> it's like, Jack, he's 26. So I'd like to have my kids at home, frankly. I really would, but I don't. Soon enough, soon enough. Yeah. If, if Barry can get his shot, you know, and Peter will be, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be a third of the way there. We're getting our, we're getting there. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope we all get the shot. Yeah, happy, happy, happy. 
What a so nice group. To, to remind everyone next Sunday, the 24th, if you're watching on replay, you still have time to get those uh, live video chats and, and the autographs and all that we have at wizardworldvirtual.com. Also coming up this Thursday, uh, a rewatch of the Legends of Tomorrow panel with Tala Ash. She'll be on the panel doing the rewatch on Thursday. Next Saturday, Chris Kattan from Saturday Night Live. And then on J uh, February 6th, a couple of uh, panels that I think folks that uh, are in watching this will enjoy. Lark Voorhees from Saved by the Bell. Uh, Lisa Turtle will be on. And Morgan Fairchild will do a panel on February 6th. Those will be fun. Yeah. Uh, for folks love Morgan. Who love um, 80s. We love and Morgan and Lark. Um, so once again, for John O'Hurley, Barry Bostwick, Jim J. Bullock, Lydia Cornell, and Peter Scolari. I'm Jerry Milani. Thanks so much for joining us today on Wizard World Virtual Experiences. We'll see you again really soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jerry. Bye.